So now in our past couple of videos, we've been looking at Mendel's model. And specifically, we established one of his laws in the previous videos, and that was the law of segregation. This next video is going to be devoted to his second law that came out of the experiments he did with the pea plants, known as the law of independent independent assortment. So this is his second law, something you should definitely know, and we're going to look at the next entire flowchart based off of this law. So in this second law of inheritance, let's write this down over here. This is Mendel's second law of inheritance. He explains a very, very important, unique characteristic of genetics. In this law, this law itself states that two or more genes assort, this is independent assortment, assort independently, that's right, independently during gamete formation. So, two or more genes assort independently during gamete formation. I'll get into the example, the sort of way to understand this in just a second, but one final thought you should understand about the second law of inheritance is that this leads to the idea that each pair of alleles, because remember, alleles come in pairs, one from mom, one from dad, segregate independently. Write that in big letters and underline it of all other alleles. Basically what we're saying by the second law of inheritance is that every gene acts, every pair of alleles, let's say, acts independently. They don't require sort of the um, knowing what another allele is going to do. Everybody moves in their own way when we talk about segregation, when we talk about meiosis, when we talk about anaphase specifically. So I'm going to sort of continue discussing this as we move forward. But in addition to the idea of the law of independent assortment, another thing that comes up that you have to understand is the idea of dihybrids. Because, look, we've previously talked about a monohybrid. A monohybrid was something like this. Capital G, lowercase g. One change from the parent. Because the parents were either this or this, right? Monohybrid, hybrid meaning like offspring, there's only one change from the parent. This guy is different from its mom based off of the lack of a lowercase g, and he's different from his dad based off of the lack of that second capital G. But what about a dihybrid? Dihybrids are what's very important in the second law of inheritance. This is a monohybrid. A dihybrid will be defined as individuals who or hets, or heterozygotes, I'll just write hets for short, for two, count them, one, two characters being followed. And what are characters again? Those are inheritable characteristics, inheritable features, okay? Two characters being followed. So I think the best way to understand this dihybrid nonsense is to look at an example. So let's draw an example here, a very basic example so that we have sort of a premise, a basis, to talk about this law of inheritance, this law of independent assortment specifically. An example could be the idea of, let's say, um, seed color, change it up, seed color, with seed shape. Two things that Mendel did observe. And for the purposes of, let's say, um, continuance and the purposes of consistency, I'll continue with the idea that seed color can be represented um, by two different alleles that we're comfortable with, hopefully, capital G and lowercase g, and seed shape will then be represented by two different alleles now because it's a different gene, it's a completely different characteristic, by capital R and lowercase r. And we have to know what each of these mean. We know that capital G from our previous videos means green. It's dominant. This is the one that's more dominant to its recessive counterpart, which is yellow. Okay? And in seed shape, which is our new allele, our new gene, let's say that capital R stands for round seeds 
and lowercase r stands for wrinkled seeds. So there are two options. You can either be a round or a wrinkled seed, or in terms of your color, I mean, and in terms of your color, you can be green or yellow. Now we've gotten a lot more complex. Can you imagine how complex we as humans are in terms of our genes? I've only introduced two new things, one new thing specifically. Imagine how complex we are. And that's something you'll look at in human chromosomes and inheritance later on. But moving forward, from this idea, this example that we've set, we can understand some key points. So there are some key points to understand in the law of independent assortment before we actually do any of the crosses. The key points to understand is that um, you're going to get a new phenotypic ratio. And this is a ratio you should remember. Phenotypic ratio. A new phenotypic ratio will be, and you have to remember this, something known as the 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 phenotypic ratio. Now, I'm not going to explain this ratio in great detail because you actually don't need to know it specifically. You'll definitely get a better idea in lecture and by looking at figures in your textbook of what this means based off of the crosses that are done. But all I want you to know for right now is that the phenotypic ratio of a law, something that shows the law of independent assortment, of a dihybrid specifically, dihybrid cross will give us 9 to 3 to 3 to 1. Also know that this is going to only work if alleles are on different pairs. So I'm going to write that down. Only works if alleles, and what we mean by that is if seed shape and seed color, only works if alleles are on different pairs, are on different pairs of homologous chromosomes. So seed color and seed shape have to be on different homologous chromosomes in order for this to work, in order for our dihybrid cross to work. And I'm going to write that down over here, actually. We're writing these key points right now as a preface to the dihybrid cross that we're going to be doing later. Dihybrid cross. Specifically dihybrid, let's write test cross. So some of the key points of a dihybrid test cross are going to be listed here as we talk about this a little bit later. So only works if alleles are on different pairs of homologous chromosomes. Let's not forget what homologous chromosomes are and understand that they have to be on different pairs in order for this to work. In addition, this all is based on meiosis. This is why you learn meiosis in such great detail. Biology is a cumulative subject and we're going to build off of our knowledge of meiosis by understanding that homologous chromosomes um, line up randomly at metaphase 1. This is something that was established when we talked about meiosis. They don't choose, pick and choose where they want to stand on metaphase 1. They just randomly line up somewhere. And what this is going to cause is the, mo the most important thing, one of the most important things possible in the study of biology itself, genetic variation. Randomness is good. Randomness promotes this genetic variation. These are some of the key points. Independent assortment is a mode of randomly, genetically varying from each other. Very important note to understand these key points. So what is the actual dihybrid test cross? Now this is a little bit more complicated than a monohybrid test cross, of course, but specifically a dihybrid test cross, we can say, is used to determine, just like before, the geno, the genotype of a dominant phenotype. That's all it is. It's the same thing as before. How do we figure out the dominant phenotype's genotype? we have to understand and use a test cross. So what do you do in this situation? In this situation, you're going to similarly, as a monohybrid test cross, mate with individual who is something that you absolutely know for sure, homo recessive, homozygous recessive at both loci. What do we mean by this? Why are we saying both all of a sudden? This is the dihybrid cross, guys. This is looking at seed shape and seed color. So we have to make this dominant phenotype with somebody who we absolutely know has a first certain seed color and seed shape. Let me draw this out for you real quick. There are two possible dihybrid test cross that can happen. Let's imagine we have uh, an individual that's a green um, and round uh, color and seed shape. That individual can either be this or 
that individual can be this. Both of these denote somebody, a plant that has green seed color and round seed shape. Both show the same phenotype. How do we figure out which is which? We have to cross both in a dihybrid test cross with an individual who's homozygous recessive at both loci. So what is that individual? That individual is very simply lowercase everywhere. Just like this. Once we do this, now I'm not going to actually do the cross, you're not responsible for this cross specifically. You will figure out very quickly and very easily what the genotypic ratios are and what the genotypes are and you will easily be able to see. I can already tell you right now, in this one right here, every single offspring is going to be what? Every single offspring is going to be green because there's a capital here that's going to dominate both of these and there's going to also be every single offspring round because it's going to dominate both round, uh, both wrinkled uh, alleles over here. Now, this is a very important idea to understand that this is a dihybrid test cross. The most important thing I would understand is the nuance, the new idea that you can do this at two different loci to look at two different examples, two different traits, and these are the key points. Our phenotypic ratio is based off of this cross. When you cross two F1 individuals, such as this, you will end up with a 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 phenotypic ratio. Know this fact. I'm not going to do the actual cross. There's a little bit too much detail. And understand the idea of independent assortment as stated here.